go. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody who's watching live, or just hello to anybody who's watching it uh, later. Uh, my name is Ron Davidson. I am the Special Collections Librarian at the, here at the Sandusky Library. Uh, you might also hear me uh, identified as the archivist. I'm in charge of the local history archives in, in, here in the library. Uh, the archives, of course, are original documents in various formats uh, that tell lots of stories. Uh, and there are so many stories in the, in the archives. You, you have many stories in the books, and there are many stories in the archives. The difference is you have to find your own story here in the archives. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more later, but let me start with a little... Uh, overview of what we have in the, the Archives Research Center down here in the lower level of the library. Uh, let's start here, right over to the side here. We have the good old-fashioned microfilm readers. We have two microfilm readers here, and over here we have a more modern style uh, microfilm uh, scanner, uh, which allows you to read the, the microfilm and also uh, save it digitally to a USB drive or uh, email it to yourself and you have a digital copy that you can do whatever you want with. Okay. We also have a computer here in the, the Archives Research Center that's the index to the burial records of the Oakland Cemetery. So if you wanted to, let's go back a little, if you wanted to search a name Let's just say Follett. I used Follett as the surname to search. You click the search button and it gives a list of the names of the, the Follett's who are buried in the Oakland Cemetery. Let's pick Oren Follett. You might recognize that name. Oren Follett of the Follett House, uh, where you'll be visiting virtually tomorrow if you like. Uh, this is an actual burial record. He lived to 97 years old. Uh, it tells you exactly where he was buried. In many cases, it tells you the cause of, the, of death of the person. Very good for genealogists and just others who wanted to research their family for whatever reason. Our microphone is held here. Uh, we have the, nearly the entire run of the Sandusky Register and its predecessor newspapers, originally called the Clarion, also called the Daily Sandusky. And we have them from 1822 uh, to almost the present. We have uh, to about 2015 on microfilm. We also now have an online version called Newspaper Archives. Presently, it's available outside of the library building because of the, the COVID circumstances. Since we're closed, it is uh, the, the, the company has given us special dispensation to offer it to the outside of the library, but once the library reopens, it's, it's a service that's only limited inside. Is it it's not? Um, we have, uh, we now, I uh, believe, um, we now have, the, you'll be able to access it outside uh, using your library card. Oh, sorry. So you'll, you'll have to, you'll have to use your library card to log in, uh, just like you would with the um, Ohio Web Library, but we should, you should still be able to use that outside. Now it's okay. It's it changes a lot. So, who uses the archives in uh, the special collections area? Uh, it's used by a lot of different people. Uh, we have a genealogy collection of books just outside the door here. Uh, to be honest, most of the genealogy books don't get much use anymore because we have so much online except for our, this first row of shelves, which is our local, very local history of Sandusky and Erie County, a little bit of Huron County and Otto County. Uh, we have some uh, city directories, school, high school yearbooks, a few indexes of death records, and, uh, and several, uh, many, many uh, books on specific topics related to local history. So the genealogists and the local historians spend a lot of time uh, at that shelf, 
But the other shelves don't get as much work. They're more uh, general history, general guides to genealogy and, and uh, directories of other areas that don't get as much access because it's we've got so many online resources now for genealogy. Well, let's show you a little more of what we have physically and then we'll get into the, uh, the collections themselves. I showed you this scanner. We also have a copy machine uh, which uh, also copies to uh, digital files. You can scan. In most cases, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, any materials you do see here at the library, at, in the special collections area, in the archives, you'll be able to copy with due diligence, with care, uh, use this copy machine, and you could scan it, print out a paper copy, or you could scan a digital copy of most of what we have. There are some restrictions. Some of this material is pretty fragile. And you have to be careful with it. But in most cases, you'd be allowed, you'd be allowed to, to make your own copies. Uh, we have uh, a map cabinet. We have several maps. Let me pull one out. I should have done this earlier. We have several maps of the area and various other things. The cabinet itself is locked. You'd have to come and ask a librarian to show you what you have. But this is always right on the very top. This is one of our uh, our treasures. Of course, this is just a copy of it. But this is the very first map of the city of Sandusky. You might hear it called in shorthand among the historians the the Platte map, the Sandusky Platte. This is it. It was this map was drawn and published in 1818. This is the first map of the the city and you can see the the extent of the city was just a little bit another popular one uh, you might have heard the term Sanborn maps these are spectacular tools uh, just for curiosity but also for uh, local historians and uh, even genealogists it shows you not only a map of the property but it gives a brief just yeah, there we go. I can't go further than this. Okay. Yeah, we're having some problem with signal in, in, in here, but hopefully we don't lose it again. Uh, these maps will show you the property, what it's used for, uh, what it's built of, what it's constructed of, as in bricks, stone, wood frame. Uh, it's a really fascinating thing, and if you you learn about your ancestor and you want to find out how they lived. Uh, you can see the neighborhood they lived in and what it was like. Really fascinating stuff. This one is from about uh, 1955. This one is a very early one from 1886. And it shows the map maps of Sandusky. Let me open it to the, the main map showing the entire city. And you see some are colored and some are blank, some are white. The white spots were parts of the town that weren't really de weren't developed enough for the insurance adjuster to be interested in it. These maps were originally designed for insurance adjusters to, to describe the property so uh, it al allowed the insurance agents to write an appropriate policy uh, fire insurance policy on the property. That's why they're described as wood frames, stone, etc. If you look at the factory descriptions, they'll even say whether they had a night watchman, whether they have fire extinguishers on site. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. And this one, this is normally available, not available except by request. Let's go inside. This door is usually shut. I should have shut it for a surprise. This is what we call the archive storage area. This is our treasure chest of the, the archives. This is where we keep all our, our precious materials, are often one of a kind. Uh, 
historical documents, records, and various other items related to Sandusky, uh, Erie County local history. Erie, Sandusky, Erie County, Firelands uh, local history. Primarily Sandusky and Erie County. And here you see, I'm going to put this back. You see we have compact shelving. We have compact shelving. Uh, allows you to store a lot more in a smaller space. You just roll them like this. And it's very easy to use. Uh, and you might see in much larger archives, they actually have motorized compact shelving. But we just have seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, six rows of shelving. So we, uh, the handle is. Here's where we keep everything uh, historically, nearly every, uh, everything. Oh, I should backtrack a little bit. We have uh, the difference between the archives and the museum collections. Some people might say, uh, to oversimplify, the archives collections are flat and mostly paper and the museum collections are, are three-dimensional. That's oversimplifying it, but it's a, it's, it's a good rule of thumb. Here we have mostly paper-related materials. Again, that's oversimplifying. We have collections. Here's a, uh, we store old yearbooks. We have some out front, and we have more pristine copies here for permanent storage. We have many different kinds of documents here. Uh, we have old journals, business journals, uh, business records, uh, scrapbooks, a few diaries, lots of really fascinating things here in, in the collections. Uh, they are stored on these shelves in archivally sound boxes, as the saying goes. The boxes are designed to uh, protect from light exposure. They're actually designed to absorb water in case, uh, God forbid, we have a flood. The boxes will soak up more water than a typical, a normal uh, cardboard box would soak up to help prevent damage from the uh, flooding. We also have various precautions to, to monitor the environment. If you look down here, and you can't get in without the... I don't know. We'll find out. We have a water alert monitor. It's actually designed if there's moisture on the floor, somehow the sensor can tell that there's moisture and an alarm will go off. We have environmental monitoring here uh, showing the temperature and the humidity in this room. And actually, the humidity is a lot higher than normal, and I don't know why. Uh, we'll have to look into that for some reason. A good humidity rate for storing documents should be about 50% or even a little lower is best. 70% is kind of humid. So we have to worry about that. And you see behind this wall, this... In this wall, behind, we have a little steel door. Behind that door are two tanks of a chemical and name I forgot. It's a fire suppressant system. If you look up on the ceiling, not that, that's the alarm. Oh, where'd we go? If you look up on the ceiling, we have this little exhaust thing here. If for some reason we had a fire, uh, if, when the fire alarm would go off, it, it would, when it would sense that there was heat of a fire inside the building, inside this area, the, this fire suppression system would go off. It's a non-liquid, it's a dry suppression system. So it, would, it allows us to put out the fire with as little water damage as possible. Problem is, 
does this by removing the oxygen. So it's, it's a very dangerous thing if you're in here. But there is a, we have an emergency stop button if it ever went off by accident. But yes, these are very valuable materials. Uh, and so we take extreme care with them and preserve them well, I hope. You see the, the storage boxes, various items are, we have paper in, in these boxes, we will have photographs in these boxes and various other uh, things within the boxes. Uh, I took a few things out. I think we covered all the routine. How, how many items are in, our, in the archives? About. About. Uh, yeah, I printed that out. We have approximately... Oh, 20 to 30,000 photographs, about one third of them are digitized and available online. Yeah, that's what we should get into. Digitized and available online through our uh, the library's website. If you find the link called Past Perfect Local History Archives. And many of those photographs are online. Of course, not everything is going to be online. It's just physically impossible. Uh, and it gets expensive too, but the most important, the most, the most widely used, let's put it that way, many of the most widely used photographs are online and some other documents are online. Mostly, however, you're going to have to come and visit and hopefully, hopefully that will be soon once this situation is, is over. Uh, we have Oh, approximately maybe it's in the archives documents are measured by feet rather than by items because each sheet of paper it would be hard to count each sheet of paper we have approximately oh I'd say about 200 linear feet of uh, historical documents which isn't a lot in the archives field you go to some some big museum big libraries, big archives, and they're literally in the tens of thousands of feet. Uh, but we have a great, a good little collection on materials related to Sandusky and Erie County and the surrounding area and the history behind it. Okay, so let's, uh, if there's, I can't think of anything else we need to talk about here. Let's go have a little bit of show and tell as just a few examples, samples from our collection of some of the most uh, typical or, or noteworthy materials we have in our collection. We do carry, uh, of course, we carry our own archives of the Sandusky Library. Here's one box of it here. This is one that is one of the most interesting items in it in the, the libraries, the archives of the library itself. This is an original letter written to Mrs. Moss, uh, Mrs. J. Moss, who was the, pre uh, well, she was the vice president, I believe, of the li library association at the time. And they were trying to ac acquire sufficient funding to build their own library building. At this time, they still didn't have their own building. They were renting space first at the high school and then later at the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the Masonic Temple. So they were seeking money. And at this time, Andrew Carnegie was giving money out for libraries. So Mrs. Moss apparently knew Andrew Carnegie personally and he she asked him for for help in funding the library and this is a letter he wrote back to her uh, my dear Mrs. Moss you're due you're duly received uh, I, I shall do all I can about 19th uh, some of it I can't read uh, but I hear there are there are six eligible applicants for every place. However, I can probably, yeah, something for the next meeting. 
I shall be glad to consider you. I think that's what it says. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Come and see how fortunate I am. He actually invited her to visit. Regards to Miss, uh, to Mr. and Mrs. To Mr. and Miss, his da her daughter. Uh, yours always, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, fortunately, later, he did find the money, and we did receive a... A, a grant of funding to build the library, and we're standing in the basement of the original library building right now. We have all different kinds of things. We have clubs. Clubs were v v still popular to this day, but clubs, social clubs, were extremely popular in the 19th century in particular, and even into the early 20th century. We have records of several of these social clubs and service clubs. Uh, we have records, for example, of the Kiwanis Club. We have records of the Daughters of the American Re Revolution. Um, uh, better, I can't remember anymore, but we have several others. Here is one, for example. This is a social club. It's called the Art Study Club. And it was in existence into the 21st century. Unfortunately, they disbanded since then. This, these are the, the meeting minutes from 1923 to 1930. Uh, the Art Study Club was just what the name implies. They would uh, gather together and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, study various arts. Uh, each each member would be assigned a a topic in art, and they would present a lecture and presentation on art to each other to learn more about the, the subject. Aha! Uh -huh, we see something little little informative talk for those of you uh, preservation nerds. We see here the uh, this is their their book. We see that they had some clippings, and you notice there's a big stain on the facing page, exactly the size of that clipping. And you know what that is? That is acid leaching off of the newsprint. Newsprint was not made to, to be permanent, permanent, so they used the cheapest type of paper possible. And the cheap paper was made with the process using acid, and acid makes things deteriorate really fast. So, it's probably too late now, but the best thing to do, and I should probably do it, to make it not happen worse, if some, if you have a clipping in your book, put in a sheet of acid-free paper as a buffer, as they call it, so it won't stay in the other side of the page. You notice the the pages of the book itself are holding up pretty well. They're probably at a lower acid content. And see, now this is great for genealogists and people just who just want to study the history of Sandusky, of Sandusky's women, many other stories you could tell just from these books. Uh, here's the names of all the, the women who were involved in 1925 and 1926. This must be their attendance records. Uh, and we have their names, and I'm sure we have the full names in other places. So if you want to research the life of your ancestor, this would be a fun way to do it. Here is an, we have a lot of very valuable collections, very important, very unique, and some of them might even be monetarily valuable. And we, uh, some of these have been set aside. These are extremely valuable and very precious, so we've set these aside. Most of these are related to the Johnson's Island Prison. And you notice, one thing I should have told you, you notice I'm using bare hands right now. We do have white cotton gloves. The rule of thumb, uh, is that you wear gloves with the, the uh, old documents. The rule of thumb has kind of changed a little bit in the archives profession. 
uh, I, I handle this without my, my gloves on. And that's considered acceptable now because I wash my hands and I keep them clean. Uh, paper documents, you, you wear a glove, you can't really get a good grip. So if you have a valuable paper document, you probably don't want to put gloves on. You probably just want to use clean hands so you don't, so you can better handle the document without tearing it or damaging it. This one is a little different. This one, I wear gloves. Oops, it's upside down. This is a extremely important, how did I get upside down? Extremely important record of our history. This is an autograph album, which doesn't seem to them. Seems pretty commonplace until you open it up and it says A.M. Murchison, Johnson's Island, Ohio, January 1864. A.M. Murchison was a prisoner on Johnson's Island and he had this autograph album and he got the autographs of his fellow prisoners and he or somebody else on the first page. Now here's where I should take my glove off because I don't want to tear the pages. I want to get a grip on them. He or somebody else drew a picture of the prison. Isn't that a fascinating picture? This was his perception of the prison. And it's, it's amazing. It's a wonderful piece of history. And it gives, me, it gives us a good idea of what the prison actually looked like. And you see, here are signatures of his fellow prisoners. And they all sign their name, sign their rank, and put their rank down, the unit, their hometown, very fascinating stuff. This is a very popular item among local historians. Uh, among historians of the Civil War in Johnson's Island. This box was made after the fact, years later. I'm not sure by who, but it was a good idea. Oops. And this helps preserve it a little better. We have several other items related to Johnson's Island, uh, including some publications. Those are... Well, let's skip to the Johnson's Island stuff first. We have some fascinating materials. This is a dance card for a, a party given by and for the officers of Johnson's Island, where they apparently invited the ladies of Sandusky to come in and dance. And you would take this card. Uh, this was all of the, the officers who were, arranged the party. And you would take this card, and they had a list of dances that they were going to have in the order they had it. And if you had a dance you would write down the name of your dance partner to keep it as a souvenir, as a memento. Uh, supper didn't even start. You had 12 dances, and then you had supper at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and then you danced 12 more dances after, 12, after midnight. That must have been a fun time if you could stay awake. We have several other documents. This was a produced by the the prisoners themselves. They must have gotten permission to print this announcement of a play that they, the prisoners were performing. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yes, the 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 public, the Sandusky public, was allowed to come and view it. There's another one and several letters. And here we have. This is a recent, besides this one, this is another drawing of the island. 
in color. Another fascinating drawing. And recently, we were lucky enough to acquire a, another treasure related to Johnson's Island. This is a roster of the prisoners in Johnson's Island. The date isn't precise, but it's approximately from 1864, I believe. Some of these sheets were, doc were dated, some were not, so it's hard to get a precise date on these. But this lists all the prisoners and in which building they were housed in the prison. This, these materials have been transcribed and they are available online uh, through the Heidelberg University website that has information about Johnson's Island and its archaeology. Uh, here's, uh, these are just a few, does anybody know what a tintype is? These are very small tintypes of the members of Company B of the Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Uh, I forgot which regiment. Company B of which regiment? <laughs> I can't remember. But they were uh, mostly local men. So Hoffman's Battalion, the, uh, In, the Johnson's Island Guards? I'm not sure. I don't think it is. I think it's uh, an, a combat unit. And we have plenty of other materials. This one is another interesting material, is an interesting item. This is an original newspaper bound in a, in a, uh, in a book binding. It's called the Spirit of the Times newspaper from Batavia, New York. So why do we have a newspaper from Batavia, New York? We're coll our collection is, has to do with Sandusky and Erie County, right? Well, here's the secret. You might recognize this name. Spirit of the Times, published every Friday by O. Follett. Yes, Oren Follett of the Follett House, who was a very prominent businessman and local citizen through most of the 19th century here in Sandusky. Uh, he was born in New York State and his first major business business venture was to create this newspaper in Batavia, New York, which is about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester, for those of you know, in western New York. And he, uh, he published this newspaper for a couple of years before deciding to move over to Sandusky in the early 1830s. Interesting story. If you might have heard if you're a history buff, a local history buff, you might have heard of this boat called the Walk on the Water. It's famous for being the first known steamboat to uh, to float on the on the Great Lakes, Lake Erie in particular. Uh, and it, it was said to have uh, landed a few times uh, at Venice, which was a separate village distinct from Sandusky in the 1820s. Uh, but it, it was around here. You might, you'll see in here, this is the original newspaper telling, you, telling us the story of the loss of the steamboat walk in the water, right down there. It was famous as being the first boat, first steamboat on the, on the lakes uh, but it didn't last very long. It sank just outside of Buffalo in 1821. It was floated in 1819 or 20, and it sank in 1821. And here's the original story, uh, original account of that sinking. Uh, we have many other items. What else? Oh, yeah, a few more items around this side. Here's where we really need to have gloves. We have many older formats that are no longer exist, but we preserve them. 
for the history. Sometimes some of these items we preserve and we don't really know the history, but hopefully someday somebody will. This is a good example. This entire box is a good example of that. These are glass plate negatives. For those of you who... Let's see. I can move. For those of you who are uh, historians of the photography process, the very original photographs were just unique items printed, on, uh, printed directly onto paper or glass, and they're one of a kind. But then the uh, a new invention of the negative photography was developed. The first negatives were made directly on glass. The advantage of glass negatives is that the glass is so smooth and clear, uh, you could get really, really sharp images on a glass negative. The obvious disadvantage is that they're very fragile. And so this box is designed for preserving these fragile negatives. Uh, we have paper. And you notice that the paper is all folded to avoid putting a seam directly on the glass. Because if you put a seam of the paper on the glass, it could irritate the film and damage it. So this paper is designed to prevent that. And these glass negatives go in this box. Oh, I forgot. I'm going to do it in order anyway. And this box is compartmentalized so you don't have too many uh, glass plates stacked together. And there's lots of insulation to keep them from breaking. Uh, the cardboard is designed to give so you can put your hands in and get them out nice and easy. We have many documents. Again, we saw a picture of a woman. We don't know who that woman is. Maybe someday we will. We hope. But even if we don't know, it's a good piece of uh, history just to show you a typical, the appearance of a typical woman of the time. Uh, I guess we'll wind up a little bit with one more. This is one of my favorite items. As I said, I told you already, the archives is full of stories and you just have to find out what the story is. And sometimes you can't tell what the story is until you look closer. Here is a, this is an actual copy of the guest register from the West House Hotel. The West House was a, was for many years the largest, most prominent hotel in Sandusky. It was right at the foot of Columbus Avenue, out where uh, the State Theater is today. And it was, it was a high-rise hotel for the time. It was uh, four or five stories, I forget. Uh, but any, most of the people who arrived from out of town went to the West House. They got on the train or the steamboat and they, they landed right at the foot of Columbus Avenue and walked right over to the West House. And for those of you, you watch old movies and you see somebody goes into the hotel in an old movie and the, the desk clerk hands them the book that they have to sign. That's what this is. And so the guests would come in and they would sign, sign in when they stayed in, in, the, in the West House. This is Tuesday, May 29th, 1860. That Mr., I presume it's Mr. Stone from Columbus was the first person who arrived that day. And then if you look closely, the last name, last two names on this register. If you look at it, it says James Buchanan, uh, Wheatland, Pennsylvania, Destination White House, and John Floyd, Destination Washington, D.C. This is 1860. James Buchanan was the president. He was going to the White House. And uh, you look up John Floyd, he was the Secretary of War 
for the United States at that time. And the first time I saw this, I thought, wow, this is a great piece of history. No, I didn't know that James Buchanan came to town. Nobody's ever said that. And I thought, wow, I'm going to have to tell people about this. And I, in the meantime, I just started, I kept turning pages to look at some more of the document. And then a few pages later, I come to Wednesday, June 6th. And the last signatures for the day on Wednesday, June 6th, George Washington, Destination Mount Vernon, and Mountain, Martin Van Buren from New York. And you notice the handwriting is the same as the other one. So I think we could assume since George Washington and Martin Van Buren didn't come to Sandusky, they were both dead by then. I think we could, and I don't think they would have the exact same handwriting as James Buchanan did. I think we can assume that there was a desk clerk with a weird sense of humor who would type in, who would, type, <laughs> who would write in fake names just for his personal entertainment at the end of the day. There was a few others, too, that I noticed in retrospect, like uh, John Bunyan from Pilgrim's Pro Progress. You might recognize that name. Pilgrim's Progress was one of the most popular books, children's books from of the 19th century. So that's the story of this book it's it's a it's a weird story and that's what makes it fun in the archives uh, that's the basics of the archives oh yeah we have uh and let me tell i almost forgot a few more things this is in the archives but it's a unique part of the archives we want you to make your own archives as well we have a collection of materials for you to help you preserve a collection of tools to help you preserve your own personal archives uh, to convert your eight millimeter film to digital uh, so if you want have old home movies and who has the projector to watch them anymore you can bring them in here you can convert them to digital and uh, Watch them on your computer, on your computer screen. We have, you could also do similar with your photographs and film. We have a lot of people coming in, uh, scanning their old slides and vacation photographs. You could do that here. We have a scanner. Uh, you, you scan them to the computer and in Scan, uh, put them on a, a, a your own disk, your, your own drive. We also have VHS conversion. If you made home movies of the later era, the really old home movies are on film. The more recent home movies were on VHS, or you might have had uh, the, the mini VHS camcorders. We have a converter uh, and adapter, I should say. If you had the, the mini cassettes that were in the camcorder, you could uh, convert your, your old VHS films, or videos, to digital films. You can put these on a, 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 a DVD. So we have a lot of resources, a lot of information, a lot of services available here in the Archives Research Center. Lots of stories and lots of tools to help you preserve your own stories. And that's about it. I'll be available. Send us questions anytime you like. We can answer your questions uh, through the, 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 the Facebook page or you could call us. We're open here at the reference desk is open for phone calls from uh, 
10 till 6 Monday through Thursday, 10 till 5 on Friday, and 10 till 2 on Saturday. Uh, if you have any questions, any, uh, any information you want to know about the, the archives, the local history collections, or anything else you, you need to know about, uh, thank you for watching, and please feel free to contact me anytime you have a question. Thank you.